My name is JJ Bola. Uh, I'll keep the introduction really short. Um, I'm a poet and a writer. Um, and uh, I'm going to yeah, perform some pieces on my free and then we're going to have a, 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 a wonderful discussion with my uh, Ugandan brother, CJ, who uh, leads writers, writers group. And um, yeah, just kind of get into the meat of it. So I've got a few pieces that I'm going to uh, perform. The first one is called Refuge, which is about my experience as uh, a refugee coming from the Congo to the UK and you know, that kind of journey. Mm -hmm. Imagine how it feels to be chased out of home, to have your grip ripped, loosened from your fingertips, something that you so dearly held onto, like a lover's hand that slipped when it has pulled away, you are always reaching. My father would speak of home, reaching. Speaking of familiar faces, the girl next door, who would eventually grow up to be my mother, the fruit seller at the market, the lonely man at the top of the road who nobody spoke to, and our house at the bottom of the street, lit up by a single flickering lamp where beyond was only darkness. There, they would sit and tell stories of monsters that lurked and came only at night. To catch the children who sat and listened to stories of monsters that lurked, this is how they lived. Each memory buried. An artifact left to be discovered by archaeologists, the last words on a dying family member's lips, this was sacred. Did not even monsters contain it? But there were monsters that came during the day. Monsters who tore families apart with their giant hands and fingers that slept on triggers. The sound of gunshots ripping through the sky became familiar like the tapping of rainfall on a windowsill. Monsters that would kill and hide behind speeches, suits and tires. Monsters that would chase families away, forcing them to leave everything behind. I remember when we first stepped off the plane. Everything was foreign, unfamiliar, uninviting. Even the air in my lungs left me short of breath. We came here to find refuge. They called us refugees. So we hid ourselves in their language until we sounded just like them, changed the way we dressed to look just like them, made this our home until we lived just like them and began to speak of familiar faces, the girl next door who would eventually grow up to be a mother, the fruit seller at the market, the lonely man at the top of the road who nobody spoke to and our house at the bottom of the street, lit up by a single flickering lamp where beyond was only darkness there. We would sit and watch police that lurked and came only at night to arrest the youths who sat and watched police that lurked this is how we live. I remember one day I heard them say to me, they come here to take our jobs. They need to go back to where they came from, not knowing that I was one of the ones who came. I told them that a refugee is simply someone who is trying to make a home. So next time, when you go home, tuck your children in and kiss your families good night. Be glad that the monsters never came for you in their suits and tires, never came for you in the newspapers where the media lies, never came for you, so you are not despised. I know that deep inside the hearts of each and every one of us, we are all always reaching for a place that we can call home. Um, the next one is about uh, masculinity, uh, which is a subject we're gonna, that we're going to be getting into. Um, so I'll just go straight to the poem. It's called Real Men. I was told to be a man, a real man. Apparently that meant not to cry. That meant my eyes had to be like shutters. So when it came to emotions, my feelings were like the church monastery. I had none. I was told that to cry was to show weakness. And in this world, you have to be strong to survive. Walk with a mask on your face, a screw face, and never show what's going on inside from young. We were taught how to make guns out of fingers until we became old enough to shoot them. Guard your heart from the start, we danced bad to Michael Jackson thriller until we became real life smooth crim criminals. Conditioned by the media, subliminal, this isn't human nature, it is indoctrination. Our voices were silent, so we practiced violence on all platforms from PlayStation to Xbox to that boy Michael's face. See, we were never taught it was wrong. Because as a real man, anger is the only conditioned accepted response. Just think of how uncomfortable you get when you see a grown man cry. Think of the number of times your mother used to say, Big boys don't cry. So it's no surprise to see that in society, men commit up to 90% of all violent crimes because we are always angry inside. So to be a real man is to live a lie. But I was told to be a real man. So misogynistic words like bitches lingered in the tidbits of our tongues. We lived in concrete blocks with no gardens, but we'll still ask where the hoes at. Listen, bro, fact is, we were lied to. 
We are told that it's okay for a man to sleep with as many women as he wants, but we are never told about love, never told that love could heal the greatest pain like a needle to the vein. It is the drug that we need. I wish we could sell bags of love. Instead of crack or weed, just imagine the change that you would see. Crack addicts would just be people who are high on love. And crack babies would just be babies who were born with love. And rehab would be where the haters went. <laughs> Fact is, we were lied to. Given negative images for us to aspire to. So to be a real man is just another lie too. So this goes out to all the men who are real because they have beating hearts who aren't afraid to cry. Men whose emotions show as clear as the moonlit sky. Men who write poetry in the middle of the night and read books and meet up at the coffee shop or the library to discuss bell hooks we will call. Men who can speak of, love, of, speak, of love, speak of love openly, like an envelope open me and you will see what is written inside. Men who want love, but not the kind you make in the club, the kind that your ancestors once spoke of. It isn't a myth. Imagine roses of red written in hieroglyphs, old to a naked beauty in Meroitic script. Swahili spoken word across the Serengeti, speaking about how the beauty of the sunrise over the horizon reminds us of the beauty in a woman's face when she smiles. Listen bro, fact is we were lied to. Give a negative images for us to aspire to, so why would you want to be a real man when you can be you? So be you. Do not be confined by society's ideals because real men don't exist, only men who are real. Tell them, which is uh, from a collection of poems that I put together called uh, Word. Um, and uh, yeah, it's called Tell Them, and they have names. And when they turn the bodies over to count the number of closed eyes, and they tell you 800,000, you say no. That was my uncle. He wore bright colored shirts and pointy shoes. Two million, you say no. That was my auntie. Her laughter could sweep you up like the wind to leaves on the ground. Six million, you say no, that was my mother. Her arms, the only place I have ever not known fear. Three million, you say no, that was my love. We used to dance, oh how we used to dance. Or 147, you say no, that was our hope, our future, the brains of the family. And when they tell you that you come from war, you say no. I come from hands held in prayer when we eat together. When they tell you that you come from conflict, you say no. I come from sweat on skin glistening from shining sun. When they tell you that you come from genocide, you say no. I come from the first smile of a newborn child with tiny hands. When they tell you that you come from rape, you say no. And you tell them about every time you have ever loved. Tell them that you are from mother, carrying you on her back until you could walk, until you could run, until you could fly. Tell them that you are from father, holding you up to the night sky full of stars and saying, look, child, this is what you are made of. From long summers, full moons, flowing rivers, and sand dunes, you tell them that you are an ocean that no cup could ever hold. <laughs> I, I, I don't envy myself right now because <laughs> after such a powerful, sorry, after such a powerful performance, I don't know where to start from. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll start from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, JJ, in your poetry, um, especially in the second piece that you performed, you make references to, to lyrics that you've had from rap music specifically, and then to talk about how it shapes how we think about masculinity. So, um, you're a poet, and this is not the only image of a young black man. How come you're not a rapper? <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I, when I first started uh, reading and performing poetry, I was asked that question all, literally all the time. Right? And it's like, um, it was so normal, that suggestion, you know, for, uh, uh, based on obviously a, a, a stereotype of what kind of expression young black males uh, are allowed, you know, particularly uh, in relation to, to, to their masculinity. Uh, for me, in regards to like my own journey, I always loved freedom. 
right? I'm an absolutely terrible rapper. I've tried. I've not done anything. But there's definitely a connection between. But there's definitely, yeah. I mean, I grew up on a lot of hip hop and a lot of rap, you know. And so, uh, particularly, it was hip on hip hop and rap that kind of fueled my passion for literature, my passion for words and wordplay. I remember listening to, there was an underground, uh, when underground radio was really popular, there was an underground uh, UK rap radio station, right? And um, they played a lot of UK uh, rap and hip hop where a lot of the artists had these like wordplays and like amazing rhythms, you know, with four letter, five, five uh, syllable words and so on. And that really fueled my passion to, to, to learn uh, about more and to kind of expand my vocabulary. But being a teenager and also being from inner city London and going to a comprehensive secondary school, you know, there, there's, you, you're, you kind of like exist in the duality or dichotomy where there's one aspect where it's like, okay, I'm really passionate about books. But, you know, if you look at what's happening outside in regards to, you know, the, the streets or the roads and so on and so on, that kind of like inner city, like uh, community violence and so on, particularly that goes on within the communities, it's, it's difficult to balance the two because it's seen as a sign of weakness, you know, literature. And, uh, but when you're a rapper, so to speak, right, there's a particular, like your masculinity is almost heightened. You know, and poetry is all almost kind of seen as more of a feminine endeavor. Right? So, yeah, like a lot softer. So I was asked that question all the time, and um, luckily, you know, were it not for uh, the people around me who said, "No, actually, you shouldn't be rapping," right? I probably <laughs> would be a really bad rapper. <laughs> <laughs> so we should stand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, given the fact that you left the you left Kinshasa when you were, when you were sick, right? So you come here and then you go through high school here, mm -hmm. and the poetry that you were reading in school, like in because mm -hmm. I went to high school in Uganda and mm -hmm. reading Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So how how did you connect to that yeah. idea of poetry? Well, it's interesting because I I had a really terrible experience with poetry. Uh, well, I wasn't particularly creative uh, during my like, school, school periods and you know we read Shakespeare, we read um, William Blake, Keats and so on. I really, I don't, I really like, I enjoyed reading Keats, I enjoyed the language and so on, but I just didn't like how it was taught. You know? And particularly in relation to the classism, the racism that was associated around it, you know, the, the subtleties of that. Um, and how disenfranchised <coughs> it was, particularly as a young black male, uh, and also like a first generation refugee, you know, kind of took you a bit uh, further away from that. So when I read it formally, uh, I, I really struggled to connect with it. You know, my, my teachers weren't encouraging at all. And I remember um, specifically being told by a teacher, who, who I won't name, um, and, and saying, oh, it's okay if you don't understand, this is just not for you. Mm. And I was like, what do you mean? Name and shame. Name and shame. Get out of here. But um, yeah, it's, uh, well, I, I remember t uh, taking myself away from that and I, I started writing poetry almost accidentally uh, many years after. And that's when I was able to relate to it in a way that, like, for instance, John Keats, uh, when he wrote Endymion, he was madly in love. Right. And he wrote a lot of love poems where he was just genuinely a young man in love. Right. Mm and not uh, writing to be to, to be read as part of like a, a national curriculum <laughs> 200 years later, you know. And so when I kind of related that experience to my own experience, into a global experience, reading other poets as well, like Pablo Neruda, for instance, it, it just made more sense as opposed to it being uh, uh, some kind of curricular exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the home more. Yeah. Um, so I've seen that you're very active beyond, mm -hmm. the, beyond the poetry. You're also very active in talking about what is happening in the Congo. Mm -hmm. um, right, women, exploitation of minerals, um, Western intervention, Ugandan intervention, and things like that. So how, and of course, in light of the, this movement against the politicizing of literature, right? Just mm. we, we just produce arts, we don't mm. produce politics, so don't ask us about politics. Mm. So how come you interested in politics and a, a lot of it comes out in your arts? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, art is political, 
art is it's a political battlefield. I mean, I don't know how any artist uh, uh, can avoid that, really and truly. Um, Nina, Nina Simone says uh, the purpose of uh, an artist is to reflect the times, right? And also it's a reflection of your experience. And what I've come to notice is that when I was writing about my own experience, right, essentially I started off writing as, like, just in terms of my own experience, not necessarily raising awareness or making people understand what's happening in Congo, right? I was just writing about my experience, but within a particular narrative uh, of being in the West, it became political because it was seen as you're speaking against the government. And I thought this isn't my own conclusion, this is actually just the record, record of what's happened. So if my existence alone, if this, if this art is an expression of my existence, then of course it is political. And that also means that my existence is political. Right? And so if you look at uh, the, like particularly history and a lot of like the books that have been found, a lot of like the artists who have been influential um, in regards to just how they simply uh, express themselves within a particular uh, period of time, then I think it's the duty and responsibility of every artist, you know, to to, to use that art in, 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 in that reminds <coughs> people about what's going on in the world. And I think in regards to Congo, you're, you're seeing um, a, a conflict mineral war where six million people, uh, at least six million people, have been killed. You know, where at the peak of it, and this is over the past 17 years, where at the peak of it, uh, over a thousand women were victims of rape or sexual violence on a daily basis. Right? And we can't remove ourselves from it because it's connected to our own experience here. And just from how I've been able to write about it, it's already touched so many people who have just come into contact through art, you know, as opposed to you know, to, uh, me drafting a 10-point plan uh, uh, to join a party about what we're going to do. You know, and I think art is, has the ability to, to touch people in a way that politics doesn't. And that's just kind of like how I, I approach things. Yeah, uh, speaking of the rape again, um, this, this particular point of yours, which is the point where you talk about this particular Oh, I'm thinking I'm male, you're male, and our male privilege, then mm -hmm. let's face it, Bachelor gives us this privilege to the extent that your voice writing about a woman who's been raped it, it doesn't go through the censorship that a woman writing about her own rape will go through. So how do you negotiate that space as, as a male, knowing that you may not face this particular type of oppression, mm. but you have to talk about how do you negotiate that? Space? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, uh, patriarchy and male privilege, uh, if I can, for well, want of a way to articulate it in a better way, it's just a bit shit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, really and truly, right? And, um, and also, if quite dehumanizing uh, and a lot of men we don't realize that and I remember growing up how invested I was in patriarchy in terms of how I express myself in terms of how I view women in terms of my relationship <coughs> with other men you know, um, with my father we, when I was you know a teenager we used to be sat in the same room for eight hours and no one would say a word I definitely wouldn't say a word right and all he would do is say commands Right. Be like, okay, pass me the remote. <laughs> Have you done your homework? Yes. Like just little things like that, you know, all these commands. And that's so dehumanizing, you know, it takes away from our humanity in the sense that you know, don't we're not able to interact. And so when I began to understand that and remove myself from that, I was able to see the humanity in myself, right, in my system. But also that allowed me to see the humanity in others. And I think particularly in regards to how to write about women, uh, particularly women of of uh, Congo, it's done in a way that, I mean, uh, firstly, it's uh, my mother, right, my aunties, you know, women I know in the community, it's uh, the relationship I have is from a human point of view, you know, I go, I, I essentially kind of remove myself from my own experience and vicariously live through them and try to kind of imagine what kind of struggles it is, you know, and I, um, hear the story of, for instance, there's a, a woman called Mama Masika who uh, was a survivor of rape and her story 
is just, I, I, there, there are no words to describe the kind of trauma that, that she's been through. And I try to use her experience uh, because regardless of the trauma that she's experienced, she's continued to go on to create a foundation that helps other women who are survivors of rape. You know, and that kind of strength is is incomprehensible. You know, because I had so many times just by writing about, it, I feel like giving up. You know, but imagine experience that, and it's like imagine experience that. And it's those little things that actually help me to connect with the humanity. I think a lot of us men have to learn to see women in a way that we don't objectify and we don't commodify them, you know, not just in terms of like, we have to go beyond uh, a, a way in terms of the need for what they can do for us, you know, be submissive to us and so on and so on. And once you begin to see that between man and yourself, there's, um, sorry, feel free to interject as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I can talk. I used to get into, into trouble at school all the time for talking. <laughs> 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 down that side. Go down that side. Right? No one said that actually. So, um, but yeah, it's just uh, essentially it's about that humanizing experience. And whether it's in that particular poem or the poems that are in, it's like we all carry narratives inside us. You know, even like if I look across this room, everyone here has a unique individual story of what they've been through, what they've experienced, you know, how they've grown, right? Even in the last year, you know, if you just think about how you've grown in the last year from this point to then, what you've done, right? Is there's a certain element of growth and we all have that narrative and it's it's necessary to complete the human story, right? But when we're not aware of that, we sometimes fall into the, the, the hegemony in terms of okay, you must be like this. Must be like that. They tell you if you identify as this, then you're that. If you identify whatever the category is, whether it's you're black, you're woman, you're Muslim, so on and so on. Hegemony creates this reductionist narrative of how you must exist, but with so much more complex than that. And I've also noticed that you've been writing and talking a lot about uh, black lives and what is happening to mm. young men in the US and other places. And yeah. This is the current race situation. People think shouldn't be talked about. It's I know it's it's it's, it's weird, like because um I mean I was in America for three months uh, quite recently, mm -hmm. and the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, around police brutality that's affected black men, black women, and black children. Um, we only begin to really understand it at the point of when someone's been killed, mm -hmm. right? We don't necessarily talk about the day-to-day -day microaggressions mm -hmm. that people experience, how people, how communities live in fear, right? Um, I was in Oakland and uh, I was visiting Merritt College, which is um, right close to Fruitvale Station. Uh, Fruitvale Station is, um, uh, if, uh, there's a really good movie called Fruitvale Station. And, uh, and just being where uh, a young man was killed at the train station, right? And I saw that. And I was like, to be part of that community, you have to be, you have to be daily, like reminded on a daily basis. This is what happened. There was an injustice here. You know. Um, also, there was a time when I was taking the train, and I was walking towards this police officer. He looked at me. We made eye contact. He looked at me. He had his hand in his pocket. I mean, obviously there aren't. He had his gun uh, on the holster. He had his hands in his pocket. He looked at me, and as I was walking towards him, he did a very subtle movement. Took his hands out of his pocket and just placed on his gun, like. And I was just like, well, it's about to pop up. <laughs> you know, but it's those, it's those subtle, small microaggressions, right, that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, and to the point where it's, uh, uh, when it explodes, and then, uh, you know, someone gets killed disproportionately. And, you know, we're not uh, talking about, uh, I think, I hope people really understand, it's not about which life is more important. Right. It's about actually paying attention to the disproportionate frequencies of events that are happening and uh, those injustices. And yeah, I think we have to, as well, start to look at oppressed people um, beyond just their victimization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, for instance, if someone can't like support you at times when you're happy, they shouldn't just be there your times on your side, right? Because it's just only seeing one level of your humanity, right? And me, in terms of black, like being a young black male, um, young African male, you know, the majority of my times, I'm happy, I'm happy, enjoying life, 
right? And then of course you start to think of different like fashion rates. Right? <laughs> 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 right? Yeah. The majority of the time, you know, you, you enjoy life, you enjoy existence. So uh, yeah, which which brings me to the point of contact with Pan Africanism, mm -hmm. yeah, because as we know, Pan Africanism emerged out of restless injustice. But do we can we imagine Pan Africanism outside responding to injustice? Can we think of Pan Africanism in enjoying life? In definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, because Pan-Africanism isn't really discussed nowadays, right? It's not really spoken about in activist circles, in uh, progressive uh, political circles, or uh, in regards to ideology, right? And one of the things, interestingly, about Pan-Africanism is it's often thought of as being a response to European uh, enslavement or colonialism, it's a response to European conquest. But the principles of Pan-Africanism, you know, uh, they, they, they embody ideas of egalitarianism, of communalism, of culture and arts and literature. All of those are a facets of African existence that go right back as far as, you know, Kingdom of Congo, even further back to Nubia, Kush, Kemet, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's before Western invasion. In fact, that's when, uh, you know, the Greeks and the Romans were coming to, to Africa right to learn and to become scholars and so on and so on and then take it back you know it's really interesting in regards to like pythagoras's theorem being pythagoras's theorem when there's already pyramids that existed i just have to have to right mm -hmm. but we have to start to think of uh, pan-africanism and also african identity and cultures and existence prior to colo like colonialism and enslavement and if we look at how societies are formed society goes from the self to the family, you know, to the clan or the, the ethnic group, then to, to the nation and then the continent, right? We, uh, we, we expand in that way. And uh, Kwame Ture says that, uh, you know, Pan-Africanism was, in, Pan was interrupted, mm -hmm. essentially. You know, that it wasn't allowed to pursue its natural course. And I think any of us who, like, uh, who are of African descent or the African diaspora, or any of us who are interested in African culture, and many of us here have uh, uh, like indulged in African culture, even when we, you know, haven't been aware of it. Like, if you've been to Nando's, for instance, right? Nando's, <laughs> <laughs> Nando's you know, it's an African restaurant. Interestingly, no one thinks of it as that. And, all, and also the music that they play as well, right? Is you know, the majority of the time is African music or music of the global south. You know, if we listen to a particular artist or you know, musician and so on, this all the whole world benefits from you know African culture, and not only from African culture but also the resources, natural resources. Everyone in this room has a mobile phone. Everyone in this room has a smartphone, I assume. Right? Um, and and we're all on a daily basis, right, consuming African culture, consuming African resources and, and, and ideas and so on and so on. But we we, we, we pay no homage or no reference sort of, to Africa beyond or outside of a Western context. You know, and um, I think that's one of the things that we kind of like have to challenge ourselves. And I think pan Africanism, although I'm not a particular uh, ideologue, I don't believe in isms necessarily, right? I just think uh, there, is, there are some ways to navigate and understand you know, the world that we live in, politics. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still relevant. Fair enough. I think that's a good point to bring in everyone else, uh, those who have questions, comments to add. That will take about three and then you respond and then we have another one. Yeah. You mentioned in your poem the work of Bell Hooks as influential to your understanding of black masculinity. Are there any other authors that you would cite as influential? Um so Bell Hooks uh, in, in regards to I'll oh, take them. Three, okay. Yeah. 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 Hi, so um, I am married to a black man and I'm raising a small black child. Um, and my Congratulations. Partner, <laughs> <laughs> um, my partner is I identify as a feminist. He also identifies as a feminist. And we're really interested in raising our kids to be 
to challenge patriarchy, to challenge homophobia, to, to really be a good dude. You know? um, and it's really hard. And <laughs> I also think it's hard for my partner. We live in, we're from America, we live in Europe now, in Amsterdam. I think he finds it really difficult to build community with other guys like him to find black men who, you know, I think patriarchy helps to bond men. <clears throat> so if you're not into sports, if you're not into like talking about women, what, it, how do you bond with other men? <laughs> and I'm interested to hear how you've navigated, you know, obviously, I mean, I think in one of your pieces you talked about um, just like talking to other dudes about poetry, you know, late at night. Um, where, where are they? <laughs> you know, it's like, obviously, it's, it's, we exist, you exist, but it's like, how do you build community with other black men and, and help to bring up the future generations of black babies? With, you know, when it's, it seems like it's so disconnected, it's so hard to get beyond the traditional forms of connecting through patriarchy. Yeah. Okay, hi, my name is Barbara. Um, I co-founded an uh, African literature publishing company called Bahati Books. Um, I have a question. Um, a lot of your work has focused on patriarchy and, you know, especially the kind of role that men kind of need to play more actively in terms of dismantling the structures. One of the things that I found sometimes when it comes to um, circles, um, particularly in Africa and African circles when it comes to patriarchy is the discussion is still very much kind of um, heterosexual. So it's about women's role. Um, there's not very much discussion. Um, I say this because uh, one of our authors that we represent is a transgender lady who is currently going through, um, and that's already a different ball game. And sometimes when people are talking about patriarchy and one of the things that I find um, as an African, we say, okay, we should be more inclusive, but just of straight women. Um, there's nothing about, okay, we're inclusive of gay people um, of color or Asians of color um, who are gay or who are transgender. So it'd be interesting to kind of get your take on that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's me. Right, uh, other authors. Um, <laughs> did you mean like uh, specifically women authors or just generally? Both. Okay, um, so yeah, Bell Hooks uh, particularly was hugely influential early on. Um, uh, I read uh, Sora Neil Hurston, Aaron Dighty Roy, um, Audrey Lord, Asata Shakur. Um, just uh, Ayi Kwe Amar is one of my favorite favorite authors. Um, there's and I think as well there's uh, there's a range of I read a lot of non-fiction books. So uh, Franz Fanon, um, uh, Paolo Ferreira, Pedro Cajio of the Press is amazing for those. I highly recommend that book. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, um, George Orwell. Um, and I, for, for me, it's um, in regards to reading, it's really about re removing yourself from your own experience, your own, your own media experience. Right? It's kind of like traveling. Right? When you travel somewhere and you don't know anyone, then you're almost kind of forced to create, recreate yourself. Right? When you don't know anyone, you don't know the place, you don't know the language or the people. And I think about it, that was my parents' experience coming to this country. They didn't know the language. Like, you know, they did not know a single person here. And I think of myself as like, okay, so I have to, and that's why I have to try and travel as much as possible. I right? almost like recreate that experience so I understand what it was like for them. You know? And um, so yeah, I, uh, those uh, a lot of those authors I'd highly, highly recommend. Um, I read a lot of my a lot of my favourite writers are dead, unfortunately. Uh, I can't read them. Um, but yeah, I've got a reading list on my blog as well. Uh, if you're if you're interested, um, and I can tweet that later. Um, so in regards to where all the men. Uh, <laughs> no, they're, all, they're, they're, they're all vampires. <laughs> no, um, I think social media is brilliant, right? And through social media, I've been able to connect with a lot of different guys who uh, have these progressive views. And what I find is that, particularly in a circle of men, right, you'll find that a lot of men actually have these progressive views, but it's 
who's uh, going to be the one to take risks and actually bring it forward, mm -hmm. you know? And what happens, because masculinity and patriarchy is so rigid, right, and we all judge each other, and it's all a performance, masculinity is definitely a performance, you know, and we all continue to perform on a daily basis. So whoever can step out of that, right, is one who actually risks, you know, doing, like, being harmed, right? Um, but if you can, like what I would say is slowly, it's a very slow process, try and you have to tolerate a lot. Not to say that, you know, oh, I'm liberated, I'm a liberated man now. No, like, <laughs> there's still elements of me that are patriarchal, you know, um, in a sense, like, for instance, um, uh, I remember I was, like, walking on the outside of the road, you know, thinking, like, oh, I'm, I'm the protector of a woman, you know, like, and so on. <laughs> I remember I started doing a bit of more martial, uh, Muay Thai, like, martial arts for exercise. And there was this like little five foot three lady, um, and we was just doing like sparring, and um, and then they put me to partner with her, and I was like, oh, I'll just take it easy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right? And she hit me right in my stern, like I lost my job. <laughs> and I I couldn't breathe for about two minutes. <laughs> and, um, of course, I shouldn't probably shouldn't be saying this publicly, but um, <laughs> like that little things like that, you know, really help to, to, to remove those like patriarchal and masculine conditions that a lot of men have and a lot of men don't, men don't have that experience so I would say try to it's a slow process try to cultivate that um, within your minor circles and I think it's, it's not an immediate thing you know you will slowly slowly begin to change a lot of the, uh, the, I don't, guys minds around you I remember my friends I've known for like 10 years who previously used to be very patriarchal and now starting to think of things in a different way and I would say that for men who can't yet um, think beyond patriarchal conditioning, try to use the women in their lives as a gateway. Not necessarily the only, it's not the only way, but as a gateway for them to understand. Because the saying generally goes, a lot of men become feminists once they have daughters, right? Mm -hmm. Because they realize how much patriarchy actually affects them. You know, and it's not that we don't know, we definitely do know how much it benefits us, right? But in a, in a hierarchical, hierarchical society where everything's based on privilege and benefits, and especially if you're team humanizing far removed from that privilege, we're going to try and hold on to whatever little privilege that you have. And sometimes it's like the, the little privilege that you get, you see how people so forcefully like, hold on to it. And a lot of men are doing that performance, you know, because they know that they can't get that privilege anywhere else from the inner society based on privilege. So I would say, like, just continue to slowly cultivate um, that processing and, and just, like, get your son to read a lot, I think, which I'm probably sure you're doing already anyway. Um, hopefully that answers your question a bit. Um, and in regards to uh, sexuality, gender, homophobia um, within Africa, right? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, <coughs> it's a difficult one to answer within the context of Africa, I think. Um, I suppose maybe within the context of your poetry or your right. activism, um, okay. maybe what are you doing, into, or are you doing anything? Um, so initially, uh, particularly in regards to homophobia, right, is I didn't think that I could speak out, you know, in regards to, you know, defending um, people who are victims of homophobia. What I tried to do is maybe like to amplify the voices of those who, who, who were fighting that fight. Right? But then I realized actually there are other heterosexual men who still I could speak to, who I could relate to, right, that are carrying homophobic, even if it's underlying homophobic, uh, uh, you know, beliefs. Right? But I think it's particularly in, uh, it, it, I think we have a particular responsibility, right, uh, as uh, within the African and black context for us, for particularly men who are heterosexual, to speak to other heterosexual men and, and to check them, right, at a point where if they start to express sentiments of homophobia and so on, because at the end of the day, like, we're all people, you know, and I think there's a conversation in regards to uh, homophobia that we're not having and how so much of it is tied into religiosity and so how much of it is tied into patriarchy and so on and so on. Because I remember myself, you know, from a young age, I was uh, brought up in a very fundamentally Christian household. Right? And this isn't a criticism of Christianity and so on and so on. Like, that's a completely different conversation. But I'm just talking about my experiences. And it was that experience that, from a young age, led me to be homophobic because I justified it in the sense of, well, it's wrong because in this book it says it's wrong. Right? 
But when I started to look at things beyond that, right, and then I started to actually speak to people who were gay, I was just like, well, actually, like, <laughs> you're just like me. Do you know what I mean? Like, and it's like that kind of experience, you know, um, and uh, it, is, it is really difficult. Um, but I think more of us who are heterosexual, particularly men, because it's, it's, it's like the burden falls on men, particularly within the community, because we are the ones who uh, uh, kind of like practicing that. I mean, when we are quite a large scale. And we don't realize the detrimental effects that it does have, the resources that we do lose, in terms of like just the human resources, right? And how, like, um, you know, Tony Morrison says that racism is, is, is a distraction, right? So you constantly have to justify your humanity. And if they say, you know, oh, you didn't have any, you didn't have any writing, and then you prove that you had writing. You didn't have any art, and you prove that you had art. And that's just racism. So can we imagine how much more it must be of a distraction in regards to racism, sexism, and homophobia? Like, look at all the, the genius that we're losing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of like how much further along it could be. You know, the, the, the Dogon um, mapped the Sirius uh, star galaxy system, right? In 3000 BC, they mapped that, right? And I'm just thinking, wow, like we could have been living there already. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But, you know, you, know, like, and you look at all the conquests and the colonialism and the imperialism that's happened around the world, like just think of how much further humanity could be. And why are we wasting so much time in, in, in a place that's just, you know, it's a, we have a finite time here, you know, knowing that, why are we continuing to harm each other? Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Your um, we have another round. Okay, go here, there, <coughs> and here. Okay. Um, I, I really, uh, I, I really love what you said about uh, masculinity as a performance. I think that that's absolutely true. And so I want to ask you a question: of How do you find that um, men of colour treat you as a as a poet? Um, like, say, you mentioned French guys you've known a long time, but also like people who. Uh, people you meet more recently, um, how do you find they treat you? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I was thinking, how does the industry treat you? How do you feel you're getting on in the industry? Yeah. That's, that's basically. Do you find that a lot too? First one is, because I work talk about looking at oppressed people beyond their oppression. Like, I'm interested in how you do that within your actual work. Because I wrote um, a play about um, some of the things that have been American police mentality, and it just feels so intense. And I'm trying to figure out how I present my characters as people experiencing things, as well as people experiencing this bigger narrative as well. And my second is, um, you talked about consuming African resources and culture. And I, I want to question whether there's any concern that the extent to which we're doing that and the continuing damaging effects is almost a continuation of the colonial project. Okay. Um, so how I was treated by my peers when I first started reading poetry. Well, interestingly, um, when I first started reading poetry, um, my sexuality was questioned a lot, <laughs> um, which is <laughs> quite bizarre. Um, so. Uh, yeah, my sexuality was questioned a lot. People had thought that I turned gay. Um, well, sorry, I should, that's not the phrase that I should be using in terms of turning. <laughs> but, that's what people think. Uh, and uh, initially, there was, uh, particularly around the peers that I'd grown up in, there was just a uh, kind of very little understanding of it. So I did a lot of, a lot of things uh, alone. Start going to open mics alone, so, you know, a lot of the readings I've done, just going to different places alone. And then I, and I met other men there who were fully expressive um, in regard to their poetry and their emotions. You know, um, one of my favorite poems, uh, poets, performers was uh, David J. Hopefully, some of you may know him. And I remember listening to him perform, and he made me cry. Like he actually made me cry, right? And he himself like would perform and start crying. You know, so. Uh, engaged with his uh, emotions, particularly as, as a man. Um, but over the years, a lot of my friends, a lot of the peers around me, people that I've come to know, have kind of uh, have come to understand right, and, and see that there is a wide range of 
a masculine expression that we can express and that doesn't you know necessarily have to be limiting or or, or be an indication of our orientation at all that actually it's perfectly fine for us to express ourselves and be human and it doesn't take away from uh, us being a man when more or less it doesn't like define that any more or any less you know so uh, and, and yeah and I think increasingly I've kind of come to uh, be fine with that but at the start there was some <laughs> very bizarre experiences um, particularly in regards to my sexuality being questioned that was like the main thing um, and then uh, the next question how am I finding it in the industry right so I'm quite outspoken uh, outspoken quote unquote um, because a lot of the stuff that I do talk about you know it's political and so on and I remember early on when I started um, a lot of organisations are like you know we really like your work and you know, you've got great like writing ability and you've got talent but we just don't think our readers would be interested in <laughs> and so on and so on and I was like okay and I remember the first piece that I got uh, published was a poem that I read that I wrote about reading and it was like in these leaves I find my home where, <laughs> and so on. It was just like, very middle England right? you know, that was not related to my experience at all right? and in, like interestingly as like time went on and I just kind of like, continued you know working on my craft and that's what I was passionate about right the same organizations and institutions were that were kind of rejecting me were now kind of like oh you know can you come here and do something and I was like oh so it's kind of been a bizarre twist and it's funny because the very people who said that the very people who they said wouldn't be interested in like are some of the people who actually show the most interest mm -hmm. you know and I always find it's kind of like you know if they if you build it uh, they will come kind of philosophy I always say like you know if you're passionate about your craft like focused on your craft perfect it perfect it I've like obsessed over this ridiculous you know like on a day-to-day -day basis it's like I'll be walking down the street not even recognizing someone I know because I'm thinking oh wait that doesn't rhyme with that just like looking I'm just lost 99% of the time so if you ever do see me you be lost <laughs> but, um, but yeah it's been a quite a surreal experience but I truly do believe in that philosophy of you know you're passionate about it like your passion and your purpose you know my purpose isn't for me to be recognized or to be known but I'm highlighting a particular experience uh, that's not really spoken about, you know, um, and hopefully I'm like, hoping to bring that out and trying to inspire young, like young writers in the next generation, you know, that they can also like write something and contribute something. Uh, that's that's going to be what I've been reading. Um, and the last two questions, right, the first one was in regards to humanising uh, the oppressed, and the other one was... With the uh, way we consume African culture and resources is almost a continuation of African culture. Right, um, so Kwame Nkrumah has a really good book called Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism that I would uh, recommend everyone to read. And essentially uh, what happened with colonialism, independence was essentially a flag independence, right? From the point where you're seeing a lot of charities, a lot of corporations, uh, a lot of organisations that are exploiting uh, African resources. Um, we'll give an example, Apple for instance, right? Apple. It's, I think it's the highest, uh, uh, like the most profit, profitable corporation in the world now, right? I believe it's definitely one of them, right? And where they get their resources to make their products, right? They uh, get it from, they, they don't get it directly themselves, right? There are subsidiary organizations or corporations rather that exploit the minerals, take it out, uh, process it elsewhere, and then they buy it off them. So it's like that, that connection, and I think uh, you know, the, they gave us the we 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 rather they gave us not the right sense to but we we acquired independence. You know, but it wasn't for autonomy. That we got. Mm. You know, and I think that's the difference. Like starting to we have to really start to understand the difference between independence and autonomy and self-governance. We're at a point where we're not autonomous. We're not self-governing. You know, you look at um, uh, uh, Museveni now. You know, 30 years in power since 1986. And he essentially watched the elections. We've got Kabila in Congo who's attempting to uh, change the constitution so that he can stay in power for the third term. And that's happening across the board, right? And there's this almost this myth that, oh, okay, Western, uh, the Western imperialism has left. We're not no longer involved in Africa, so it's just your problem. 
right? This is just what this is you're doing, right? Which is just bizarre when you look at the exploitation that's happening and how um, there's there's uh, companies who are profiting to the billions, right? Based on exploitation that's happening like that. Um, but that book goes into into a lot of detail, so I would recommend that. Um, in regards to humanizing, yeah, you know, so I was saying when you write about people, just, don't just focus on one part. You know, focus on the range of emotion of what the, the people go through. Focus on the range of the culture. I know it's really difficult to, to, to do, but what I, what I do try to do when I write is I write and hopefully if it's written well enough, that person can read it and see themselves in it. Yeah. Like see the entirety of themselves in it. And I think if you've been able to do that, like you've been successful with what you've done. Like don't write for, you know, who, don't write for necessarily for the reader or for anyone else who might be observing, but write for that person who you're writing about to pick it up and then read and see themselves in there. You know, you know what? Like, thank you, well done. Like, this is my experience. Um, and that, and when you do that, you get to see the range of uh, the range of humanity in that person. We still have some time. Five eight minutes. Five eight minutes. Okay. Maybe we can take one question. Or if there is none, um, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yep, no problem. Just the guy in the chair. <laughs> <room>. um, <clears throat> you. When I started following you, you take a real shine into basketball. And I know that for um, when you talk about the concept of masculinity, there is something about only uh, being allowed in one in a couple of arenas, and one of those arenas being sports, for men to really show their passions and show their emotions and show that nuance. How do you feel between what you do literary and what you also do, because you mentor as well, how do you feel your work on the literary side of things can bridge the gap between that and trying to reach out to other members in that arena? Um, for, for me, what I try and do is uh, bring my literature into those spaces and bring those discussions into those spaces rather than just going to those spaces as an escape, because oftentimes we do. And it's necessary for us as men to find those safe spaces right, where we can have discussions uh, amongst ourselves.